Seated. Matching shoes, Val? Yes, sir. Bless your heart. <laughs> I got the other one at my house if you're looking at the other one. Some of y'all have that other shoe too, don't you? Unfortunately. Hey, it's good to be back. I had a great time last week uh, being at my granddaughter's baptism. That was a great time of celebration and blessing and uh, thanks for Pastor Strickland for covering the bases while we're gone. He always does an exceptional job. Brother Lenny preached over at the other campus. Got to go a little long-winded because he only had to do one campus. So. They know I can't go long over there. I, in fact, that's a little long today. I just got here myself. <laughs> it's good to see you. Y'all look so good today. You look like you came for church, praising the Lord. It's good to walk in and hear that sound resonating through the auditorium, people worshiping, praising God. It's a good thing when God's people get together on Sunday to worship God together. There's nothing quite so exciting as corporate worship. And to think about it, Sunday morning when the sun comes up in the very first place that it comes up in the world, Christians from all over the world start praising the Lord. And for about 24 hours, it goes on all day long as the sun makes its, as the earth makes its motions around the sun. So Sunday is the Lord's day all around the world, amen, and that we're in our socket, and praise the Lord, we'll, we'll try to do it justice, amen. But we're in the book of James, and I've been there, this is our last in the series, uh, part seven of our series, and as you well know, we could have gone well beyond just seven parts here. There's a lot to deal with and a lot to discuss in the book of James, and we've sought to do it justice, but I, there's just no way in seven weeks you're really going to cover all that's in this fabulous book. So we'll come back to it sometime in the future. We'll be hitting it again and, and looking at other parts of it and dissecting what we can get from it that the Lord has for us in each one of these. But it's been a great study. So we've looked at spiritual maturity and holiness as uh, the half-brother of Jesus presents us this challenging Word of God. In many places, it does challenge us. Some places just flat rebukes us. In other places, it encourages us. But it's a, it's a great study. I hope you've been in the lift groups been able to be a part of it in your lift group and go through it. This, uh, we'll do the lift group study of this next Sunday, uh, since there's, this is the last Sunday we'll have lift groups on the last Sunday of the month. But let's start in, in uh, really, let's, let's finish in James chapter 5. And we're going to start with verse 7 and read through the end of the chapter. Where's my little weather channel thing? Be patient, therefore, brethren, with me, your pastor. <laughs> Until the coming of the Lord, behold, the farmer awaits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late range. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now this next few words we could do a whole sermon series on. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is any among you, among, among, anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will, will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the sky poured rain. And the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Well, praise the Lord. I wasn't here to preach this last week, but Brother Tim 
came from this section dealt with about how God dealt with the rich and what James had to say to them. And now he turns from the rich to the restless and even kind of changes the, the tonage. It almost seems a, this condemnative tone, it's condemnation uh, in one tone now that changes to a more uh, conciliatory type of tone is, you know, on one side is he's rebuking the rich and now he seems to be consoling those who, would, who are the receptive. Even the, the terminology gets back to his, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren. And I haven't counted the time, but there's a few times which he uses that terminology. Again, to get back to the point of saying, all right, it's as though, and he is, he's wrapping things up, the letter's wrapping up, the points that he wants to make, he's kind of pulling it all now into to kind of a summation as he goes through there. And he appeals to them this most important thing, which he deals even in the very first chapter with them about being patient. He says, be patient. And he gives throughout the rest of this, and it's kind of the way the outline breaks down, he, he gives the essence of patience, then he talks about some examples of patience, and then he gets into the, the, the evidence in, in our own life of patience and how to be manifest in our life. So that's, that's the outline. Let's, let's go through it. First of all, he deals with the, the essence of patience. He said, therefore, brethren, uh, be patient until the coming of the Lord. And he talks about how the, the farmer will wait for the precious fruit. And he'll wait patiently for it until it receives the former rains and the latter rains. He says, so you also be patient. And, and then he speaks about the prophets and then he speaks about Job. In fact, you know, when he says, be patient then. In fact, the translation, New American Standards, yours may say, therefore be patient. Since you, everything we've shared with you, everything we've spoken to you through this letter, all this is fact and all this is truth. Since, you know, God's going to, Work in your life through situations and trials, and the, now you're going to receive and love each other as brethren. And kind of, I think the whole idea of the whole letter, from where he closes and talking about the rich to right now, is therefore, my brethren, be patient as unto the coming of the Lord. Kind of relates it back to judgment. Therefore, or then, since all this is going to happen, be patient. The, the word patient is the Greek word uh, macrothumasete. And it comes from two words, really, a compound of words. One is the word for long, which is macros, and the other is the word for temper, which is thymos. In other words, be long-tempered. It's the idea of having a, a timer set on one's temper. So, you know, it's, it's on the long run. It's the whole idea of having a long fuse. You, you've heard people talk about in regard to others who, who have a short temper. Well, he's, on, he's got a short fuse. And what the Lord is saying here is, don't be short-fused. Have a long fuse when it comes to this issue. And man, he's dealt with this on several other occasions from the very first about trials and circumstances to brothers about being cautious to speak against another brother and complaining. And he's dealt with this a whole bunch about having this attitude of patience in your walk and in your life and in your relationship with the Lord. He said, be ready, set your mind on the long run. This thing of Christianity in for a day, for a week, for a month, it's for a life. We talk in terms of following Jesus is not just today. I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my life is the mindset. I'm becoming a disciple. Disciple somebody who doesn't kind of come in for courses and leave. In the context of a biblical disciple, this is your life. This is the issue of your life. So set your mind. Set your temper. Set your attitude for the long run, for the long term. Now, he says, you know, the, the run might be, not be as long as you said because the Lord stands at the door, but the idea is you set your, your mind to say, if it takes till the day I die, I'm going to keep running this race, even if the Lord comes back tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to live my life for the long run. I'm going to live with an expectation that he could come back tomorrow, that tomorrow or today could be the Lord's day. He said, because the Lord is standing at the door. Now, remember, mixed in with this is the idea of quit groaning, <laughs> quit complaining. One, because the judge is here and the judge is looking on. And, you know, and so there's this idea of that. But, and I, but I also believe there's the idea of the hopefulness of Christ's return that we should embrace. The idea that I really am looking forward to Jesus' return, as it's called in, in the scripture, the blessed hope is really part of my life. I, sh I should be on guard as to how I behave and how I treat my brothers and how I'm living my life because the Lord's at the door. The judge is there. I shouldn't complain against my brother. Why? Paul said, you know, I I'm not going to judge another man's servant, so I don't have that right to judge you any more than you judge me. The Lord's the judge. He's at the door. But at the same time, it's the attitude of looking forward, you know. So I'm going to be patient. I'm going to look forward to the Lord. You don't know where God's taking you in this whole deal. You, you can't complain about today because you don't know what today is really all about. Most of us don't. 
We don't see the long term. I think Joseph is a good picture of this, don't you, in the Old Testament? How Joseph, you know, was sold in the, first of all, thrown in the pit by his brothers. Told dad that, you know, the lion had got him, put blood on it. Told him that's Joseph's blood. Then sold to the slave traders. Then taken and bought by Potiphar and then falsely accused by Potiphar. Thrown into prison for years. Then ultimately assumes the position as the number two head of the largest nation in the world, Egypt. Now, I'm sure Joseph had no idea about being the second ruler in Egypt when he went in the pit. Any more than you have any idea about what God might have for you in the future. So don't complain. The Lord's in charge. God's going to work it all out. Somebody railing at you, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of them. You don't need to be railing against somebody yourself. The Lord is at hand. So there's this multiple idea. It's kind of like the 50-20 principle. You know what the 50-20 principle is? It's nothing new with me. I remember reading this sometime. The 50-20 principle is based on Genesis 50-20. When Joseph is ultimately sitting there with his brothers, and they don't know who he is, remember, and they're appealing for kindness and for mercy and compassion for food and sources and resources, and Joseph finally reveals to him them that I'm your brother. But that was a pregnant pause, don't you? <laughs> it's a kind of, I know I would milk it for a little bit. I'm your brother, Joseph. You want to say, the one you threw in the pit? The one you sold? The one you lied to my father about? No, he just said, I'm your brother, Joseph. And here's the 50-20 principle. That which you intended for evil, God meant for good. This is the idea that we see here of Patience. We don't know what God is up to most of the time. We get a little insights here and there. We make choices daily based on what we believe is the will of God. But we, I mean, what's God hold for you in tomorrow? I'll be honest with you. The day I started, gave my life to Jesus, I had no idea I'd be here. That's the last thing on my mind. Yeah. I was just happy not to go to hell. <laughs> Amen. I'm just rejoicing. I'm free. I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. But God is up to something. There is this thing of destiny, not fate for the Christian. There's destiny. I believe if we'll get on the path and walk with God and be patient, it might well surprise you what God's got in store for you. So he's saying, just the judge is at hand. Let's, don't worry about things. God's in control of all these things. And then he, as he tells us this, as we're, you know, we're looking ahead to the Lord's coming in the context of all this, he gives some examples under this, this, this first element of essence of patience. There's the example of the farmer. He said, this is seen in the farmer who's, who's waiting patiently. And there's that word makothemon. Uh, this is, this is, I realize there's, there's, I've planted seeds and they don't grow today. They don't pop up tomorrow morning when the sun comes up. It takes time. And it takes situations and circumstances that I can't control, that God's in control, the former rains and the latter rains. I'm not, God has to deal with all that. So I'm just going to let God be God. Isn't that the, the idea? Ultimately, the, the farmer is a great illustration of that. And what is God going to do? He's going to bring forth that precious crop. Now, let me tell you what the precious crop is. It ain't corn. It's you. I believe, if we're really kind of comparing Scripture with Scripture, and subject with subject, that we realize... We go back to Matthew 13 where Jesus is giving the parable of the sower and the seed, that farmer who's sowing seeds. In that parable, who is the sower of the seed? Ultimately, it's the Lord. It's also in time to be us as we give our lives to Christ and share with others. But when the Lord is sowing the seed, which is the word of God, the goal is precious fruit. The Bible talks about your faith being more precious than gold and silver. There's a precious crop that God is awaiting on. And even in the context, I believe, of what he's talking about here, this former rain, latter rain, that's fall and spring rains that he's talking about, that even in the context of the fruit of the Lord, the, the crop of souls, there's a former rain or latter rain. That first rain, I believe, was Pentecost that the prophet spoke about. Jo Joel spoke about it. Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and says, that is that which God has spoken by the prophet Joel. This, this reigning out of God's grace and this reign of God's spirit into the hearts of men and women so that we can all be indwelt by the spirit of God and be made new and be made Christians. This is, and more, what a reign it was. I mean, the church is established. The, the global missions begins. The, the world is reached. 
That was a glorious rain. I believe that there, there will be a, a, another rain. I believe there's going to be a time prior to the end, at the end where the rapture takes place, of, of a great rain that's coming. Peter said, hey, listen, the Lord is patient and long-suffering, not as some men would count. Don't think that the Lord's not, not doing what he's doing. He's going to sleep is what he's saying here. The Lord's going to return. But he's been patient in the context of basically so that you and I will get right with God and be saved. And there's going to come a day, you know, when that last person's saved. And when that last person's saved, the trumpet's going to sound. We're all going to be caught up in, in the air with the Lord, all right? It's going to be a great day. So I believe there's this kind of this dual context here. One is that, uh, hey, the day of the Lord's coming. There's going to be a great harvest of souls. And, and there is a great harvest taken. We could well be in these latter days. I believe we are. We have recently preached on it, as a matter of fact. Made clear that all the things that are happening on a global level and a global scale all point to the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe in the context of these last days, there will be a great outpouring. Obviously, upon the nation of Israel when they come, we talked about that in those last sermons. But I feel in my own heart and from studying scriptures that we'll probably see one more good rain before the crop comes, before the harvest comes. Amen, where the Lord reaps a great harvest on the earth. I pray it begins in spring, Texas. Amen, I, I pray it starts at Believer's Fellowship. That out of our obedience and our love and our commitment, the sovereignty of God will smile, the greatest smile of all, and bless us with a great outpouring of His Spirit so that we're part of a great world harvest. People are being saved. Unfortunately, the Western church is not the influence. It's not what's happening anymore. What's happening now is what you used to call the 2020 window of those Asian countries and those African countries where there's a, that God is doing some supernatural things in the Mideast, even amongst the Muslim communities and the Jewish communities and the Hindu communities and the Buddhist communities all across that part of the world. Great things are happening. Let's pray for a great outpouring of God's Spirit even in our own midst. But he said, but we have to embrace whatever this attitude of looking forward. A patience that looks down the road. You know, persistence in the moment, endurance in the moment, but with a hopeful eye. And hope's a great thing to have because we're living in a generation where a lot of people don't have hope. But our hope is in Christ, and our hope is in the Lord's return. He said it'll be like the former rains, which would take place October, November in, in, in the Old Testament tradition. Latter rains, April, May. Former rains, Pentecost. Latter rains, I believe, hopefully a great outpouring. Restoration of Israel, ultimately. So we take that farmer in, into mind and, and, and realize that, first of all, it's Jesus that they're talking about and the fruit is precious souls. And the Lord is waiting and patient with us, willing that none should perish. The second example is he gives us is that of the prophets. And again, you know me, I'd like to labor a little bit more on each one of these, but we'll, we'll move through to stay on schedule. Amen. But th then you deal with the prophets who, who endured much suffering with patience. And it's that word again, macrothemia, a long temperedness is that idea, that, that long fuse. We consider them blessed and fortunate because they persevered and they endured. So we, we count them as blessed. What's the Lord saying? There is blessings that come to those who will endure, like the prophets. And you talk about a group of guys that endured. They, they were put through hell on earth, literally. They were stoned, they were mocked, they were ridiculed, they were rejected, they were imprisoned, all right? But yet they endured. They looked forward, they looked down the road, they saw well, what we're living in is a temporal world. This is not the end of all things. And we have something greater to look to. I mean, take some time. And I'm not even going to bring into all this element of Hebrews chapter 11 where it talks about those who in faith pressed forward, persevered, didn't get to see the promise necessarily fulfilled in their generation, but they kept moving forward because they believed God. He's saying, you too, like the prophets, endure, press forward. These guys, they were ridiculed, they were mocked at, they were laughed. We get ridiculed, mocked at, someone laughs at us, we're done. I don't put up with that mess, I'm moving. Get me a new husband, get me a new wife. <laughs> no endurance, no persistence. I get me a new job, I can't say that guy's a bum. You know, on and on. Hey, it's fine to change jobs, you know, if you feel like God wants you to do that. The idea here is we just, we don't, we don't live in a, in, a, in a culture that understands this context of pressing on and moving forward. It says we count those blessed and the idea of that is that same word of, of the blessings of God that talks about in the Beatitudes. It's, it really means for real happiness, not frivolous happiness. 
Then he says, and then consider Job. Remember, the, the, the Lord honored Job's perseverance by the fact that he blessed him doubly, you know, towards the end of that chapter. He loses everything, and now he gets everything and manifold blessings back. Why? Because he endured. It's interesting to note that James, when he's writing this, he didn't say that Job had this macrothemia patience, which he's mentioned earlier in, in the other instance, like the farmer, you know, and, and he, he's not talking about him. And not like the prophets, he said, Job didn't have that, but he had hupomonin, which means he had incredible steadfastness. Steadfast. He was impatient with the Lord, as you can read through the book of Job. We've been there. But even in his impatience with the Lord, he was still committed. He still pressed on. He didn't have full understanding. There was some de great deals of immaturity even in Job's life, even though the Bible says he was the most righteous man on the earth and would probably make us all look like small candles. Amen. But nonetheless, he pressed on. He persevered. He kept marching. He kept moving. Again, that is not the mindset of this generation and the culture that we live in. You know, we, we, we want to always be the blessed and the, the anointed and, and, and the, the top of the heap. And sometimes, you, you know, we don't understand at all how God may put us in a place like he did with Job to bring him to a place of greatness in his life. But he endured and he was steadfast. And then he sums it all up in, in talking, I believe, this deals with this context of, uh, again, of the essence of patience. It, it's, it's, why, why am I going to be this way? Why should I be? Well, here it is. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Praise God. That the Lord is full of compassion. Now, this is an interesting, again, I, I like to break apart some of these words, as you know. This is a compound adjective when it talks about full. The Lord's compassionate, but not only is he compassionate, he's full of compassion. And, and the word here is, is, is polysploxnos, something like that, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure most Greeks would laugh at me. But it's really from two words, polis, which means much, and the word splotchnos, which has to do with innermost, you know. Your innermost part. Sometimes it's translated as the seat of affections. Some translation have as innermost beings. He's in his innermost person. He's there's just filled with this overflowing compassion. The seat of it's used here in the New Testament. Now, I'll give you an illustration. Have you ever been standing by and seen somebody uh, uh, hurt themselves real bad, you know, or watch something on TV where somebody's cut or have one of these, you know, and all of a sudden just inside you just. It's that, the, the bowels of compassion thing, you know. That's what it's talking about. Just in your innermost being, where you sense things the most, where you, you feel things the most, where things touch you at the root, at the core of your being. And you, just, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? This means yes, all right? This will go faster if you listen. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know what that means. I know what you're talking about. I've, I've, I've experienced that. Well, the Bible says, in regards to that compassion, God's just full of that. He's just filled with compassion. It flows out of his inner being. All that he is, God is love. God is compassion. Well, that's good. Hey, let's get, let's get personal here. God is full of compassion for me. God's full of compassion for you. God was filled with compassion for these illustrations of Job and the prophets. Do you not believe that God loved dearly the prophets? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Malachi, Micah, Habakkuk, all in all. God loved those men tremendously and deeply, laid his hand upon them. Daniel, think about these great men of God. Do you think that God loves you less than he loved them? Let me give you one that may blow your mind. God loves you is as full of compassion for you as he is for his son. Because you're a joint heir of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, you may be thinking in the back of your mind, yeah, well, then why am I going through what I'm going through? <laughs> Persevere. Be patient. God's full of compassion. He knows where you are. He knows who you are. He knows what you're doing. You set your eyes on the prize. You set your eyes on the end. It's what Paul was talking about. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. I want what God has for me. I don't want anything less. You know, I, I'm not here about getting a name for myself and having my name on a plaque or something. I want God to be glorified and I want to experience the fullness of his compassion. In fact, this word polysplachnos is only used here in the whole of the New Testament this particular term, to describe the great compassion that God has for it. The second word, it says, and God is also filled with mercy. This is a word 
It's translated mercy. There's a lot of words in the English language, mercy. This Greek word is only used here and in Luke 6 when the Lord talks about being merciful and the Lord is merciful. And it's one of the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the merciful. God is merciful. We're to be merciful. This word is arctramon and it comes from the word octero, which means to have pity on. And I praise God, the Lord had pity on us because we're pretty pitiful. Amen. We can be real pitiful at times. Have you ever just kind of done something real stupid and walked away and said, boy, that's pitiful. Yeah. Praise God that he is full. And, and here's the thing about the Lord's mercy. that It's God's mercy that out of it flows everything else because he has such compassion and such pity and such care, such love for us that grace flows, redemption flows, the cross comes, Jesus you know, is given, that, that life comes, resurrection happens. There's life after death. There's heaven and not hell. That's the grace of God. And James is saying, hey, it's a race, and it's a long race. It's not a short run. It's not the 440, all right? It's not the 100 yard. It's not the 50 yard sprint. It's not, not showing up for the NFL combine. You've got to run 40 yards as fast as you can. This is a long haul. Get ready for it. It's the rest of my life. However long that might be, that's the race. Paul was at the end of his life saying, I finished the course, you know, I kept the faith, I ran the race. And praise God, we can run that race, why? Because God is so full of compassion and God is so full of pity. What more could you want? If God be for us, then who could be against us? Now, that's the essence of patience and what motivates it. The evidence of patience, it's, it's really, it's, well, let me just read this verse 12 through 16 and 14. 13 says, if you're suffering, let him pray. If you're cheerful, let him sing praises. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of offering faith will restore the one who's sick. The Lord will raise him up. His committed sins will be forgiven him. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, here's the thing. The evidence of patience is found in our words. Isn't it interesting all that he said about words in this passage? You know, be quick to hear, slow to speak, you know. Watch what you say against your brother. Watch what you say in situations. From, from, from the first of this chapter, every chapter, he's dealing with this issue about our words and anger of words and all the things that motivate bad words and wrong words. And, and now he's saying, what should we do with our words? Since the Lord stands at the door and is ready to come, then what should we do? And he, it, it gets down to this, you know, where, there, where well, there shouldn't be swearing, or, but there should be praying and praising. That's what it gets down to the context. Here's what will happen. Here's the evidence of, of patience. One, I won't swear. Now, yeah, I believe there's the inference to cursing there. Or as we say in Texas, cussing. Quit cussing. <laughs> I know some of you like to cuss. But he's saying quit cussing. He said, well, I, you know, that's just where it's raised. Ma, I got cussed at, so I cussed back. <laughs> quit cussing. But that's not the context. I mean, that, that's applicable. But the swearing here is that context of you know, I swear on this, or I swear by this, and I swear on that. And we're always saying, and people in the culture are always saying, swearing on something, but that they have not right, number one, to swear upon. And so Jesus is talking about this in Matthew when he says, let me tell you something, you, you don't swear at all. You don't swear by heaven, it's God's throne. You don't swear by earth, it's the footstool. You don't swear by Jerusalem, it's God's holy city, the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, you can't even change a hair on your head from white to black. Some of you'd like to. Well, you can go to the hairdresser and get the dye put on, all right. But I want you to know, even though it's dark, it's still gray underneath. <laughs> and if it grows, guess what's coming out? Gray, all right. No, I don't color my hair. Just for those who always accuse me of that. But anyway, <laughs> come on, lighten up, all right? <laughs> don't swear by heaven, by the earth, by Jerusalem. Don't swear on your mother's grave. Don't swear at all. Basically, the idea here is that I'm going to swear by heaven means that, you know, heaven's going to back me up on this. Let me tell you right. I don't tell God what to do. I don't impose upon the authority of God. I don't impose upon the authority of earth. I don't impose upon the authority of my mother's grave. I don't have that authority to invoke others' authority. The only authority I get is what God lets me have. All right? And the idea of me trying to manipulate 
by my words, by my oaths, by my vows in this regard, by swearing upon something is fruitless and useless and it's not going to happen anyway because I can't even change the color of my hair by thinking it and by vowing or making an oath about it. So the idea, he said, listen, if you got something, if you're going to say something, you say I'm going to do it, that sells it. Yes means yes. You don't have to add oath to it. You don't have to add a swear to it. Yes means yes. No means no. So tell people, yes or no. I always like people say, well, I'm not lying. Let me tell you something. I'm not lying. Well, you don't have to tell me that then. Just tell me the truth. <laughs> I always wonder what people tell first of all. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to tell you something, but it's not a lie. I'm thinking, oh, great. <laughs> it's an exaggeration, maybe. That's still a lie. But again, it's back to the words here. So we don't swear on anything. All right? Jesus stated here in the same thing, you don't swear by anything. It's clear you shouldn't swear in any form, in any wise, or any reason, because it is an affront to God. It's invoking against his authority, and it brings, according to verse 12, judgment. So that's one thing we don't do if we have patience. Another thing that we do in the context of the positive here is one that we're going to pray. First of all, where are we going to pray? We're going to pray for the suffering. We're going to pray for them. And this is the word in trouble. It's, it's the word which has to do with anybody that's suffering ill. Suffering on any kind of level. It's a difficult time. I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm suffering here. And so if you're suffering, my responsibility is to pray. If you're suffering, your responsibility is to pray. If I'm suffering, my responsibility is to pray. This gets back to where he was talking about just in the chapter before when he talked about where are all these problems? You've got conflicts, you've got wars going on, you fight against one another, it's because you don't get your way. All right? You don't get your way. And, and the reason, what you ought to do, he says, is ask God. He said, but when you do ask God, you ask for the wrong motives. You just want your way, so you're asking God to bless your plan. Here's my plan, bless it. He said, what you need to come down to this is, is ask God his plan. What's your will, God? What do you want, God? So if you're suffering, the idea here is to get to the point where I'm going to turn everything over to the Lord. I'm going to relate all my problems, all my situations back in prayer to God, not just trying to get out of something or get through something or get over something. I want God to be glorified in my life. Then he says, the sufficient, and this is a form of prayer. It's called praise, all right? The, the, the sufficient, those who are blessed, is anybody happy, then sing. Are you happy? Then you ought to be singing. Uh, don't you just enjoy it? You walk around people and somebody just whistling and singing. Well, what are you whistling about? I'm happy. That's what you ought to do. You, but it goes beyond that. You ought to praise the Lord happy. You ought to thank God for the blessings. Many times we're blessed and we just complain we're not blessed bigger, greater. Many times when we're, we're blessed, we just don't praise. We, we're happy, all right? We may whistle too, but we don't take time to slow down and realize that all good things, as James has said, every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Thank you for this grace. Thank you for this blessing. Thank you for what you've placed in my hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The Greek word here is soleto. It's not used a lot of times for praise. That's a different word used mostly. This is a word that originally meant to play on a string instrument, all right? So, Dennis, when you're happy, get your guitar out. Praise the Lord with it, all right? Get on the keyboards, get on any, get your harp out, whatever it is. Praise the Lord. Not just that way, though. Within the general context here is, I ought to be from my innermost being, worshiping God and giving Him the glory and thanking Him for all that He's done. This word, Saleto, is only used about four times in the New Testament. But the idea is here that we're going to sing songs of praise to God for what He has done. How many are happy today? Well, you ought to be singing to the Lord in thanksgiving to the Lord. You ought to be praising the Lord. Then he talks about prayer in another form, to the, to the sick. By the way, the suffering should elicit prayer. Sufficiency should elicit praise. And sometimes we're just doing everything but that. All right? The third part, part here is for the sick. Is any among you sick? And he talks about our response here, and he deals with this issue again of prayer. Uh, and a great deal of m misunderstanding has, has developed, obviously, from these verses here. When he talks about, is anybody sick, call for the elders, let, let them anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith, and to pray over, over this person that's sick. A lot of people use this in different ways. They, some teach that this means that, you know, if you're sick, all you've got to do is, uh, is uh, we'll come back to the string in just a minute, is all you've got to do is uh, just, just pray and God will heal you. You know, it's that prosperity doctrine that's so popular in many, many places that you're never supposed to be sick if you're a Christian. And the only reason you'd ever get sick is because sin's in your life. You know, that's the reason sickness. Well, it could be that sickness is in your life 
due to sin, but that's not the only reason sickness comes. We dealt with this in, in past sermons about sickness and the believer and why sickness comes into a believer's life and how we should relate to it. But don't get wrapped up in that philosophy that says every believer who gets sick is in sin or that every believer who gets sick ought to be instantaneously healed. That's not to be found anywhere in Scripture, all right? That's just, just, just not there. And a lot of these healers that are out there today on TV and in crusades and stuff, they don't fit the biblical pattern. You know, because they bring people on stage, some get healed, some don't get healed. And most of these media groups that follow up on these see that most people didn't get healed. When Jesus healed in massive ways like that, everybody would be healed. And nobody that was healed of a limp foot, lameness, walked away with their crutches or their wheelchairs. They were healed not only instantaneously, they were healed completely. By the way, if you want to use those illustrations, most of the people that were healed in that ministry of the Lord Jesus were not believers. All right? They weren't believers. It was, it was a sign miracle to attest the fact that Jesus is the Lord of glory, has authority over wind, weather, sickness, everything. But on the other hand, God, not dead. All right? God can still heal, and God does still heal. And so the people look at this passage and say, well, if it, that just means God's supposed to heal everybody. And there's others like the Catholics who've taken this passage and kind of come up with a justification, what you call extreme unction. You know, it's the, the practice that kind of began in the 8th century of last rites and praying over people and those kind of things, and you could get them into heaven no matter what, just to pray a little prayer and a little anointing with all. The other deal that comes with this is that in churches that I have you've been a part of in the past even, would come up with this passage. Now, what this really means is that the oil is just symbolic and represents medicine. All right? And what James is trying to tell you is, is if you get sick, because oil was used in a medicinal way many times, that you should just go to the doctor. You know, and so at all points, the elders, they would be the, you know, there weren't doctors in every community and you know, a few doctors here and there. And it, so the elders would act in this regard. And, and the word anoint is not the, the word we normally would use for the anointed one like Christos. It's another word which means to place on something or to rub on. And so what it means is for, let me put in the Joe Arms translation for these guys, have one of the elders massage you with some oil and you'll be healed. And so, but it it's, it's all has to do with that which is medicinal. Let's back up a little bit. I believe it means what it says. Oh, there's a stark thing for you in there. No! You mean the Bible means what it says? <laughs> yes. It means that if you're sick, then you turn to the church first. You turn to the Lord first. Now, God has blessed us with medicine, and God has blessed us with doctors, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. You say, what do you do when you get sick? Well, the first thing I do, I, I ask the Lord, is there any sin in my life? Because sin can open the door to sickness. Paul preached about it to the Corinthians, about they came to the Lord's table member to celebrate the, 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 the redemption and removal of sins, and they were coming with sin in their heart. You know, and what hypocrisy to come celebrate the removal and remission of sins for the cross and have sin in your life. You know, First John says, you know, we, we were saved that to, to free us from our sins. So why are we still carrying them around? And then coming to the Lord's table, says, because you dishonor the Lord in such a way and you won't discern or judge your own body in such a way, you know, you're sick. He said, some of you have died, as a matter of fact. So there is a principle that there is a sickness that can be in our life because we're disobedient to God. So the first thing, Lord, am I sick because I've been disobedient? And before I even finish that prayer, I know if, I'm, if that's it or not. Say, how are you so spiritual? No. I have the same Holy Spirit that lives in me that lives in you, and he has a way of telling me, you're not right with the Father. And I'll confess that sin. And then you say, what do you do? Well, I call the doctor and make an appointment, and then I ask one of the elders to anoint with oil. <laughs> we have seen, as a practice in our church, some of you are not quite sure what we do when we have the invitation. Many times people will come forward, and they'll ask to be anointed with oil. We've seen that on a lot, and those who have been here for a long time We've, we've witnessed a lot of people experience healing. And we've experienced a lot of people who didn't experience healing. And, you know, and the guy who didn't experience healing must know, well, uh, how come I didn't get healed? Catch this. There's several things to do. One, call for the elders. 
Two, have them anoint you with oil. And three, they should pray. That's the total responsibility there. You fulfilled yours. The elders fulfilled theirs. And then it says, and then the prayer that's prayed in faith, if it's a prayer in, prayed in faith, it'll be here. You say, well, you didn't pray in faith for me. What does it mean to pray in faith? It means, simply put, we've taught on prayer a lot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It simply means I pray according to God's will. I don't always know what God's will is any more than you always know what God's will, especially when we're praying for others. And so we ask, Lord, if it be thy will, then God do this work and do this healing in this point. You're the last word here. Hey, and if it was God's will to heal you and you were obedient to do what God told you to do, guess what? You're going to find grace and healing. Amen? That's the, that's the prayer in faith. And I think there is that connotation which talks about confessing your sins, you know? Uh, I prayed for a fellow just recently. He said, before I even come and ask for other things in my life, that I need to get right with God. And he got those things right with God. And then we prayed. So the idea here is, is not to look for some way out or to explain away this verse because we're afraid that God might not heal somebody. It might make me look bad or you look bad. The idea here is to discover what the Scripture does say and what it's saying very clearly and just believe what it says here. I believe that if I'm sick, you know, the, uh, the logical thing for me to do is, 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 to, is to ask for, for the elders to, to anoint me with oil. Well, I don't want to draw attention to myself. All right, be sick. <laughs> if you like it so much, I don't think you do. Is it, is it medicinal? That was the big question then. Or is it sacramental? Is it a spiritual thing? The issue is that we're going to obey what we understand to be the will of God. We blend prayer with the Word of God, with obedience to the Word of God, and then as God has blessed us with science, we'll use science to seek the end. But I think the first thing, even before we even go to the doctor, is, is my heart right with God? He says, then let them pray. And that's the, that's the key word, by the way, to this whole passage, this section. It's not praying for the sick, praying for that, pray, praying, praying and praising when, you, when, you're, when you're sufficient, when things are right. I mean, over and over again, James encourages us throughout this, this passage in conflict. You, you don't get what you want because you don't ask or you ask amiss. I mean, so pray. Verse 13, pray when you're in trouble. Verse 14, pray when you're sick. Verse 16, pray for one another. On 16, 7, 8, and pray. Elijah prayed. It works, is what he was saying. Forever prayer of a righteous man avails much. Things happen when we pray. So if things happen when we pray, let's pray. That's the, the gist of here. So the evidence of patience in my life is I'm going to be going to God for the answers. I'm going to be going to God for the results. I, you know, I'm going to trust the Lord. That's what's called on every one of us to do. It may be that in God's will and God's purposes, it might not be time for you to be healed physically any more than it was God's will and purpose to deliver Joseph out of that pit in the beginning of those trials. It wasn't time. And it might not be. That God may be doing something in your heart and your life that you won't ever understand until you experience what you're experiencing. We leave the results. I believe that's part of what it means to pray in faith. I'm leaving the results with God. I, it's to pray in faith. I trust God. I'm going, to try, I'm going to put all this in the Lord's hands as I do this. And the fourth thing about praying is we're praying for the straying. If anyone among you strays, someone turns him around, let him know the one who turns him back from his error will save his soul from death and will hide a multitude of sins. The word here is for straying is, is someone who's lost their way. And by the way, if you've lost your way, you are a sick one. Not in a spiritual sense, I mean not in a physical sense, but in a real spiritual sense. And it's easy to, get, to, to lose your way. Every day we're making decisions and choices about the will of God, the purposes of God, the grace of God, where we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to speak, when we're not supposed to speak. And it's easy to make wrong choices, is it not? To weigh out logic over the will of God, to lay out reason over revelation, just say this is what I ought to do. And we're going to make some mistakes. Tragically, many people begin to choose wrong and make wrong, and they compile it by making another decision and another decision. And then they get, you know, Satan comes in with his, his, his armor, with his, his army, and begins to sow false seeds in our head, lies to us about our condition and our situation. You know, or even if we get to the point where I know I need to get right with God, he said, well, what's the use of that? You know, you did that before. On and on it goes. He just keeps compiling it. So God puts it upon us as brothers and sisters in Christ to help each other in this regard. If someone's straying, they're taking a wrong path, they're going down a wrong avenue, that we turn them. First way we turn is through prayer. Where Galatians says, you know, if you're going to restore, brother, then when you do it, you know, you consider yourself, get your heart right, basically, make sure you're right with God, and you with your spirits are going to restore such a one. So the idea is my heart, my walk are right with God, and I'm going to be used by God to help somebody else 
who's missing the mark, who's going the wrong way, who's taking the wrong path. They're straying. I, I'm going to be a part of their life. Again, this is where James gets back to this whole concept of our responsibility to each other. He's dealt with this a bunch, hadn't he, his whole letter? Our responsibilities are one to another. And we're, we're here to help each other. We're here to protect each other. We're here to provide one another encouragement, perhaps maybe even a reproof at times. You're on the wrong road, man. You need to turn around. What can I do to help you? I'm here for you. I mean, you look around here today. There's people here that aren't here today that you know they're missing. Maybe I hadn't seen them going, but you have. It's your responsibility to say, that's a brother, that's a sister in Christ. I need to pick my phone up, go knock on their door. I need to visit them. I need to talk to them. I need to encourage them. He's like, hey, I love you, missing you. What can I do to help you? And pray for them. Pray. Then reach out in compassion to minister to them and to deal with them in any way that will help them. The Bible says sometimes just by pulling them out of the fire. It's a rescue action that's taking place here. And, and the, by the way, I don't believe he's talking about lost people. We know we're supposed to do that. This is not, this is not a, a, an encouragement to evangelize. This is an, an encouragement for rescue work. You know? Call, call for the spiritual ambulance. Get the, get the emergency spiritual medical team out there. <laughs> Help somebody. Reach out and point them back to Jesus Christ. So we're praying. We're praying that God moves ahead in our... In our help of reaching out to him, that God's moving while we are reaching out to him, whatever it takes to bring somebody back to the fellowship and back to the flock. Let me wrap this up very quickly. James has given pretty clear instruction on uh, how to achieve real practical and personal holiness and spiritual maturity. Bottom line, that's where we're headed in this book. Let's, let's live what we believe. Let's, let's do what we know is right. Let's hear what God is saying to us and let's respond. Sometimes it's been encouraging. Sometimes it's been very forthright. As, as I said last Sunday, it's like sometimes he's sticking his finger in your eye. You know, Ouch, that hurt. You're stepping on my toes mindset. Let that word come to you. And I kind of put this down into five points, and I'll wrap it up with this. You want to, first of all, stand with confidence. Yeah, there's going to be trials. There's going to be suffering. You're going to endure those temptations. God's doing the deep work in your life. You know. But you, you have to understand, if God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, that's the way the whole thing starts out. My brethren, consider it all joy because God's doing work. He's with you. He's in you. He's leading you. So stand with confidence and then serve with compassion as he goes in those chapters and talks about responsibility to one another and reaching out. You just can't get around being a Christian and not helping, not serving, not committing to other people. You cannot isolate yourself. The third point is then you speak. The words that do come out, they're encouragement. They're words of compassion. You really care about people. You really do care, so you speak with care and you submit with contrition to the Lord, to one another. Humble hearts that are willing to be broken. Let God mold and shape us as he desires and pleases. You know, he says where he talks about, you know, cleanse your hands and your hearts, you're filthy, you know. Get right with God. Repent. Humble yourself before God. God will exalt you. That, so let there be a genuine submission in your life. If you want to walk with God, this is, this is the practice of your life. And then share not all about you. All around you are lives that God wants you to invest in. You can't sit in this service Sunday after Sunday and never touch somebody else's life and be right with God. You can't do it. You can't sit here Sunday after Sunday and not be involved in some ministry in the fellowship in some fashion in some way. Well, I do it every Sunday. But you're not going to experience all God has for you. When we get into this next month in March, I have no idea what I'm preaching. It just frustrates me when I get to these places. Except I know what I'm preaching about. Don't know the text, don't know the outline, and for me, that drives me nuts, okay? I'm just that guy who likes to have it four weeks, six weeks, ten weeks in advance. Um, my sermon schedules, I usually lay out six to eight months at a time what I'm preaching. But I know where the Lord's leading me and topically where we're headed. And it's all about, folks, it's time for each of us to assume a personal responsibility of going further. Reaching out more. Stretching outside the boundaries of our abilities. Discovering the power and the grace of God at the next level. You want to go higher. You don't want to camp out on the side of the mountain. You want to go deeper. You know? There's more to see. There's more to be. There's more to live. There's more to experience in Christ. 
So the danger becomes when we settle for mediocrity. And I believe this is what James is dealing with here. Don't settle for mediocrity. Push forward, stretch out, get a hold of God. You're a child of God. You're a believer. And as a believer, it means that I have committed myself to be what God wants me to be. I've committed myself to do what God wants me to do. I've committed myself to say what God wants me to say. And I've committed my life to serve and to share where God wants me to serve and where God wants me to share. Spirituality, personal holiness, practical holiness, spiritual maturity involves every aspect of my life. So get on board and let God do with us as he desires to do. Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed.